I modified the title a little bit. Alex gave me metabolic disease. And so I've added toxic component to it because toxic and metabolic diseases, they, you know, we all know that they present with involvement of bilateral basal ganglia, right? Bilateral thalami. And when you have these symmetric findings in or near symmetric findings in these deep gray nuclei, trust me, it is very, very challenging because they all look very similar. They all look very similar and uh, not just challenging, but they are intimidating to, to figure out what is going on. And I will give you a reflection of this. You know, as you all know, I, I like to show some unknown cases in the beginning. And this time I'm showing you four unknown cases, right? Four unknown cases, and they're all CTs, right? And if you look carefully, actually two of them were called as normal. These two findings were not picked up at all, right? Findings were not picked up at all. And why? Because symmetry is no longer your friend, right? You see these very small hypodensities, right? A little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, and a little bit bigger and a bit more fuzzier. And if you look carefully, there are punctate densities. Now, when you see these punctate densities, you think about mineralization. Can this be something else, right? So we'll talk about those things. And again, notice that you, know, you have some historical information, but again, not a whole lot, right? Because many, many a times these patients show up in the ED. And uh, so think about these cases and see, you know, if you were reading this head CT, what would you say, right? What kind of differential will you provide? What kind of questions will you ask, right? So that's the intent of this, this whole presentation. Now I'm showing you, you know, again, another set of four unknown cases. This time, only T1 pre-contrast, right? When we are looking at a brain MRI scan, most of us, all of us, you know, the intent is to maybe check the diffusion, start with T2 or flare. And believe me, look at post-contrast, it is not uncommon that these non-contrast T1 weighted images, they are overlooked, right? We necessarily don't remember to look at them if we don't have a good approach of how to interpret a brain MRI, right? So the reason I'm showing these cases is because in all of these four scenarios, the abnormality was only seen on T1 pre-contrast, right? Every other sequence was completely normal, right? And here I'm kind of adding these arrows just for for making it clear, but this is pretty clear. This is a little sudden finding, and then again over here, right? So again, think about what would you say? What would you do? Again, what questions will you ask when you have cases like this? And now moving to bilateral thalami, right? Bilateral thalami, I'm showing you four diffusion-weighted images. Again, notice the quality of diffusion is very variable depending on your scanner, your technique, your vendor, artifacts, et cetera. Right, but again, I'm sure all of us can pick up these findings. Again, trust me, this case was completely missed because these findings were only seen on diffusion. And believe it or not, bad things happen with VIPs. And this is the chief of nephrology at our hospital, right? So, and these findings are completely missed. You know, she was a scan because of this. You know, again, I have the data over here and, you know, all right, so we'll come back and talk about this. So think about these things. Now, why, why this is such a diagnostic challenge, right? And, and of course, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, after I've shown you all these unknown cases, you are thinking, man, I mean, if I'm doing this, or if I'm reading this case, what will I say, right? Why this is a challenge? It is a challenge because these deep gray nuclei, basal ganglia and thalami, they are affected by a wide variety of disease processes. Like Alex gave me metabolic disease, but I added toxic, but I'm listing so many others over here, right? Broad categories. And I will show you examples of some of these also. The point is that many of these conditions, they can involve these deep gray nuclei. They have overlapping imaging appearances. There are some very specific aunt minis. However, accurate diagnosis will depend on two things. Number one, you have to know where else to look, right? You have a finding in the basal ganglia, which may or may not be obvious. The next approach is you have to know where to look. Hang on one second, I'm getting a phone call. <laughs> 
Hello. And uh, the second thing that you have to know and realize is that what other questions you're supposed to ask. Where else, so number one, besides basal ganglia, you know, you have a finding which is obvious or not obvious, you have to look, you have to ignore the abnormality and you look everywhere else. And when I say everywhere else, you have to check the superficial gray matter. You have to check white matter. You have to figure out where in the basal ganglia this abnormality is located. There is a very limited diagnosis, differential diagnosis when you have just involvement of one nucleus. When you have more than one nuclei that are involved, then the differential diagnosis becomes a little broad. You know, I will review all of those things. Last thing, you know, I always talk about, you know, why you all have logged into the CME because when you have lesions involving bilateral thalamide, within the thalamus, there are specific thalamic subsites, right? Textbooks don't talk about these things. And when you have involvement of a very specific subsite within the thalamus, then it has, again, a very specific differential diagnosis, right? And we discussed all of these things Oh, many of these things, you know, back in the days when, when I was a fellow. And this paper in radiographics became very popular. And it was, it is actually till date, one of the most downloaded papers of this journal. So again, you know, I'll, I'll highly, highly recommend that, you know, you should go back and review and read because many of these things that I'm, I will be talking today are already described over there. All right, now what are these deep gray nuclei? You know, we know we, we talk about basal ganglia and thalamus and some, some, uh, some professors, they, they think about these two structures as synonymous. They are not basal ganglia and thalamus. They, embryologically, they're different. Their RT retinogenous supply is different. The kinds of disease, or diseases that involve these deep gray nuclei, they are different. So we'll, we'll talk about all of those, right? We'll talk about. It. Now, the before we do go any further, the first thing that we have to understand is that many times these diseases that are involving these deep gray nuclei, they will be symmetric, right? When they are symmetric, it becomes very difficult to to identify them, to pick where is the abnormality. So what is the first clue? The first clue is we have to know what is the normal appearance, normal signal intensity on MR and normal density on CT of these deep gray nuclei. Now, since these are deep gray, they are gray matter structures, the signal intensity will match that of gray matter elsewhere. Right, so if you if this is all symmetric, you can you have an internal reference. You look at superficial gray matter and then compare and see what you have in your case is normal or abnormal. Same thing on CT. Density matches with other gray matter structures elsewhere in the brain. Now this rule has one exception, and the exception is that this structure over here is notice is darker. Right, this is darker. See, this is very dark. And this darkness is because of physiologic iron deposition, physiologic mineral deposition, right? Therefore, there are four structures in the brain where we have physiologic iron deposition. Globus pallidus, which I'm showing over here, right? Number two, substantia nigra. Number three, red nucleus. And number four, dentate nuclei, right? These structures are slightly hypointense because of, and this iron deposition is, and the appearance of low signal on MRI is a function of field strength, right? If you scan this patient from 1.5 versus 3T, and now we have 70, the signal on T1 and T2 and other structures will increase. The second thing to keep in mind that this iron deposition is also a function as we age, as we keep on aging, there is more and more iron deposition, right? So the signal keeps on changing, something to keep in mind. Now, this is the most important slide of this presentation. 
the first thing that we have to ask ourselves when we are dealing with something like this is, are these findings unilateral or bilateral? If they are bilateral, are they symmetric or are they asymmetric? Now, if something is bilateral, something is very symmetric looking, now think about conditions that are systemic, systemic, toxic, metabolic, more generalized type abnormalities will cause bilateral symmetric findings. If you have patchy, unilateral, asymmetric involvement, then you think about you know, vascular infection, inflammatory, and who knows, tumor, demyelinating, et cetera. The second most important question that you have to ask yourself if you don't know, you have to check their medical record. If it is not there, then you have to pick up the phone and call your referring physicians. That how did the patient present? What is the mode of onset, right? Did the patient present acutely, subacutely versus chronic, right? Because this will have a very significant bearing on how will you list your differential conditions. The third thing I mentioned earlier, Location, location, location. Location is the most important thing when we practice neuroradiology, right? Where is this abnormality located? And we'll, with exactly this approach that I have taken in this talk, that you know we will discuss differential diagnosis of lesions into one specific nucleus. And then what happens when you combine multiple nuclei? In the thalamus, again, I've mentioned before, what specific subside in the thalamus is involved? Now, I said earlier, there are two most important things. The first is you look outside the deep gray nuclei. When I say look outside, you check your superficial gray matter, white matter, brainstem, and cerebellum. And then you tie all of those findings together. Again, this is not an easy thing to do, which is why you know, it will take some time to grasp some of these concepts. Now, the other thing is, what are the clues that are given to you that are present on, on imaging? And I showed you some examples. Diffusion is one of them. T1 is one of them. It is the signal bright or dark on T2. And lastly, age and gender. There are certain conditions, diseases that typically involve kids and younger age individuals, right? And there are certain conditions that are generally in the middle age. And there are some in older people. Again, so again, age and gender will also be important. Now, before I show you cases, one thing that you know I always teach is abnormal findings in bilateral basal ganglia and thalamus should never be interpreted in isolation. You have to tie a lot of different things together and you have to do it very quickly because many a times these patients are very sick, right? Delay in diagnosis can kill somebody, right? So again, which is why we have to be We'll have to memorize some of these concepts. You know, I will I will highlight certain things that you know these this list of conditions you have to keep in your back pocket all the time, right? Because there is no way to to no time to you know start looking up internet and finding out, and you may not find the right thing. All right, now uh, this this is something that I put here for Alex and Alex. This is uh, you know, coming up very soon. Hopefully, this will be on the market and. Uh, and again, as you know that, you know, I love these bilateral basal ganglia things and I've included some of those on the cover page also. This case, very quickly, just to show that there was a persistent craniopharyngeal canal and this is an ectopic pituitary adenoma. We will show this case during the course of this talk. This is hypoglycemia. This is again, symmetric abnormality of bilateral optic nerves. This is myeloma involving the optic nerves very symmetric, isolated involvement of dentate nuclei, right? Very few things into that. And this was metronidazole toxicity. This is a case I showed you last time. This is rabies and cephalitis. Again, very rare, extraventricular, fourth ventricular neurocytoma, right? Fourth ventricular central neurocytoma. This is a very recent case. And this is a recently described entity also, opioid, amnestic syndrome and synthetic opioids are very you know common in the market these days unfortunately and this is this is a young person who who was overdosed with fentanyl 
and this is uremic encephalopathy. All right. Now I mentioned. So yes, yeah, can I can I interrupt you for a moment? Yes, sir. So coming back to the case of the fentanyl uh, overdose, um, and so we had a case like this uh, within the last month, uh, almost exactly the same pattern of involvement, which is the hippocampus. And and my question is, uh, do you think that is a effect of the opioid, or is this a hypoxic insult because of the susceptibility of uh, the hippocampus, uh, because you can see uh, hippocampal involvement in uh, cases of anoxia as well. Now, that's a great question. And uh, in this case, the, the story is that, you know, as you may have heard, what is happening in certain areas in, of, of Philadelphia and even in Pennsylvania, most commonly in Allentown. Allentown is a small, smallish town and just on the outside of, uh, of Philadelphia, what they are doing is they are combining three things and injecting those or, or inhaling those or ingesting those. And one particular drug, which is now very commonly found, and it was also found in this patient, is horse tranquilizer, horse tranquilizer. And uh, they combine horse tranquilizer, the fentanyl, and uh, one other thing, I'm missing that. So all three were found positive in this case. Now, going back to what Alex was asking, it is hard for, for us to, to pinpoint one abnormality because none of these patients undergo any kind of autopsy studies. But based on what we have, what we have read and what we have learned over the years is that some of these deep gray structures, including the hippocampus, as Alex said, they are very, very highly metabolic. And they have overexpression of glutamate. And glutamate causes some degree of preferential neurotoxicity. Now, that neurotoxicity causes cell death. Now, the cell death is the mechanism is hypoxic or toxic is or maybe some combination that is somewhat unclear at this point. And which is why we kind of describe it these in, in this way. So that's what I think, Alex, about this. Just, uh, yeah, thank you. And the only reason I bring that up just because I'm, I'm reminded of the literature, uh, which you may recall, in the early in the days when people recognized that the um, CSF in the subarachnoid space around the hemispheres looked different in children under anesthesia. And it was originally attributed to the anesthetic agent, and it was only later that it was determined it was the ox it's a pure oxygen effect and the and the anesthetic agent may be irrelevant so i i don't know there's an answer to it but i i just wanted to bring up that topic because it, it is an issue in these cases where you have if you have a, a drug that causes the patient to have a respiratory arrest uh then you have these two things two factors uh, but but to your point, it, it's true that this bilateral involvement is very uncommon and has been reported, I think, uniquely in patients with opioid overdoses. So uh, maybe we'll never know. Yeah, the other thing that you know we have found is that you know we call it opioid overdose or opioid. You know, in this case, opioid amnestic syndrome is what the name is is given to this entity. And a lot of times the UDS or the urine drug screen comes back as a negative, right? The problem in those scenarios is you have to call your ED physicians and tell them that I'm thinking it's a synthetic opioid. And the, the typical UDS, which is run in the, in the emergency department on bedside does not test for these synthetic opioids. So you have to, it's a send out test. It takes a few days at least, of who knows how long to come back. But you have to alert them that you are you have to to modify your your testing approach also based on what we are expecting. Okay, so I did mention briefly that you know these deep gray structures or specifically globus pallidus. You have 
physiologic deposition of calcium, right, which is physiologic, and there is physiologic deposition of iron, right? It is a function of field strength. It increases as we all age, but if this is pronounced, right? If you, if you have way too much dark signal, like the way I'm showing you in this case, then we have to think about certain conditions, certain neurodegenerative conditions. And you know, yesterday we had a case of multi-system atrophy, Parkinsonian type. There are two kinds of multi-system atrophy. One is cerebellar type, and one is Parkinsonian type, right? The Parkinsonian type typically involves the deep gray structures, the putaminal structures, globus pallidus, and there is profound iron deposition. The dark signal on T1, T2, GRE susceptibility is profound, right? And there is volume loss, right? So that becomes the classic imaging finding of MSAP or multi-system atrophy Parkinsonian type. In the cerebellar type, we all know that there is this hot cross bun sign, right, in the lower palms, and there is atrophy of the cerebellum. So two types, you know, it's kind of off topic, but, you know, I just wanted to, to mention that because, you know, th these, these things do come up, and this was a case that, that we saw yesterday. All right, now going and taking a, a very, you know, localized, specific location-based nucleus by nucleus approach, we will talk about the first nucleus, which is globus pallidus, right? I showed you this case. Right? What we have here is that there is symmetric appearing abnormality in bilateral globus pallidi, right? Notice that there is diffusion restriction. And the most common cause of the symmetric appearing abnormalities in glo bilateral globus pallidi is carbon monoxide, right? Carbon monoxide poisoning. Now, in this case, the abnormality looks very similar, right? This patient, there is no indication of carbon monoxide, right? He, and so what I always say is when you have an abnormality, you look outside the abnormality. In this case, what we found was that a significant portion of the nasal septum was missing, right? Perforated nasal septum. So we start looking for what we think this might be. And and this is what we found in the electronic medical record, right? So this is from cocaine. Now, you know, as we all we all practicing, you know, radiologists, and we have seen that for some unknown reason, many of these conditions they present in crops, right? So this case and this case, they both showed up in the same night in the ED, right? And again, notice very similar imaging findings. Patient was not doing very well, so we did MR. And on the MR, this is fine, but there is also involvement of the white matter, not just above the tentorium, but also the cerebellum. Right, so the moment you have involvement of cerebellar white matter, right, and involvement of globus pallidus like this, we think about heroin spongy form leukoencephalopathy, cerebellar white matter involvement, involvement of deep brainstem tracts, like deep brainstem tracts. Earlier, I showed you a case where there was predominant involvement of the dentate nucleus, right? In, in this scenario, the dentate nuclei, they are classically spared, right? Classically spared, and there is involvement of cerebellar white matter. The other thing to, to remember and, 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 and keep in mind is that there are very few things that symmetrically involve the posterior limb of the internal capsule. This involvement can go and extend along the optic radiation, along the optic radiation when it becomes the dragon claw sign, right? Dragon claw sign, again, a typically described finding in patients with heroin uh, intoxication. Now, this is the case, if you remember, I showed you in one of the unknown cases, pre-contrast, post-contrast, T2 and flare. Now, if you look at these sequences, right, there is no abnormality at all. The only abnormal signal on the finding you can pick up is on T1. There is no post-contrast enhancement, right? And again, there is symmetric appearing hyperintensity involving bilateral globus pallidus. And this patient had chronic liver dysfunction, cirrhosis of liver. He was almost in hepatic encephalopathy, right? And this is from manganese deposition, manganese deposition. Now this patient is very young. There is 
no abnormal liver function there is no liver cirrhosis but we have the exact same imaging findings right this exact same imaging findings everybody sees that right exact same imaging findings and this is also manganese deposition in this patient who was under total parental nutrition right total total parental nutrition. so manganese deposition can be from liver disease can be from non liver disease or non liver involvement right so this list is over here which might be helpful now i'm showing you two babies now now these two babies and believe it or not they are both 8 days old and they both presented with hyperbilirubinemia right hyperbilirubinemia and again notice very similar appearing findings in baby number 2 we have this symmetric appearing finding here in another location of basal ganglia which is the subthalamic nuclei right this is typical imaging finding of bilirubin encephalopathy or kernic teres right bilirubin encephalopathy or kernic teres now i mentioned earlier that there is physiologic iron deposition in globus pallidus now keep in mind that this physiologic iron deposition is very homogeneous if you start seeing areas of inhomogeneity inside where you think there will be physiologic iron deposition that becomes the classic what eye of tiger sign right and nbia or pecan pantothenate kinase associated neurodegeneration right it was previously known as heller warden spats disease this is the point i was illustrating that the 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 iron deposition is physiologic and it is very homogeneous right and is function of normal aging there there are lots of conditions where this process is altered the iron deposition is exaggerated or increased and then you think about all of these other conditions now this is something that you all have to keep in your back pocket right if you have isolated involvement of bilateral globus pallidus you think about the first question you ask is mode of onset did the patient present acutely or subacutely or in a more chronic way and then the differential diagnosis is over here and then you work your way accordingly keeping in mind that carbon monoxide is the most common cause of involvement of bilateral globus pallidus the next thing that, that you know i like to talk about is that you know i was you know taking a location based approach so lentiform nucleus is formed of two components medial you have globus pallidus laterally you have putamen so until now i was showing you involvement of the medial portion of the lentiform nucleus which is the globus pallidus now i'm showing you that the medial portion globus pallidus is actually going to be spared right and if that's the scenario then what do you think about take a look at this case right very unusual there is involvement of bilateral putamina and you have clues like youngish person and they were making they were experimenting with some kind of alcohol right and they presented with blindness right this is a case of methanol poisoning methanol intoxication right classically and typically involves bilateral and i think this is the case that alex might have given to me and uh, so now notice here there is hemorrhagic necrosis of bilateral putamina right methanol intoxication again another case that alex showed me uh, this was a long time ago and i think he was uh, covering inpatient service this patient comes in that's the history right that's the history and again notice all of these imaging sequences everything else except for t1 was completely normal right completely normal and what is the diagnosis here this is hyperglycemia right hyperglycemia that causes this increased signal on t1 uh, in the in the basal ganglia most commonly in the caudate and in the putamina right these findings can be unilateral these findings can be unilateral and when they are unilateral they present with contralateral other side of the body abnormal movements again you have to make a phone call and you have to ask are there any abnormal movements you have to give them what kind of abnormal movements you are expecting so you can make the right diagnosis again very important to keep in mind that hyperglycemia will present with t1 hyper intensity now when you have hyper intensity on t1 
there is a very, very limited differential diagnosis. You think about hepatic encephalopathy, I've shown already, hyperglycemia. Next one is Wilson's disease. Wilson's disease, we'll talk about that. And finally, gadolinium deposition. And I'll show that case towards the end of my talk. And this is something we have discussed previously. I've shown you also, right? You have classic appearance of both the medial and the lateral portion of the lentiform nucleus. And this, this lentiform nucleus is kind of covered by this edematous internal and external capsules, right? Internal capsule right here, external capsule right here in the form of a fork. This is called a lentiform fork sign. And this is diagnostic for uremic encephalopathy. All right, moving to uh, thalamic lesions. Now, talking about thalamic lesions, the, you know, I mentioned there are several thalamic subsites. The first thalamic subsite that I'm introducing is the portion of the thalamus, which is right next to this structure, which is the third ventricle, right? So this structure of the thalamus or this site in the thalamus, which is right on either sides of the third ventricle is called paraventricular thalamus. In this case, there is involvement of paraventricular thalami. And I'm sure you all have noticed this, right? We don't see this every day. There is abnormal signal and fusion wear in the mammillary bodies. And what there is enhancement. And what there is involvement of periaqueductal gray. And what there is involvement of perirolandic areas on either sides of the central sulcus. And anytime we see this, the first thing we have to say, give them thiamine, give them vitamin B1. This is Wernicke's encephalopathy. Also a neurosurgical emergency. These patients will go into coma very quickly and they will die. So which is why it is very important for us to make this call, right? So what are the classic imaging clues? Involvement of mammillary bodies involvement of paraventricular thalami. You can also have involvement of bilateral basal ganglia. You can have involvement of perirolandic areas and this periaqueductal gray. Always keep in the back of your mind because this is a treatable and a reversible condition. Now, I, I illustrate this case because this is not directly related to what we are talking over here, but this is something that is universally missed at every level of training. It doesn't matter how experienced you are. It doesn't matter how less experienced you are. This finding is missed universally across the board all over the world. And this finding has devastating consequences, not just for the patient, but if you're practicing in, in a place like where, where Alex and, and myself, we are, it has devastating consequences even for the radiologist, right? Anybody can tell me what are we dealing with here, right? This is dense basal artery. And this finding was completely missed by one of the most senior, one of the most experienced radiologists here at this institution, which is again, I think one of the best departments in the world, right? Very experienced. Again, notice that there is no contrast at all. This whole thing is thrombosed, right? You can see contrast in, in all other vessels. And this is the finding, right? This is the finding and you don't see anything in the brainstem in this patient. And why I'm saying this, because you, know, you, you, know, you all may not have heard about this, but this medical legal scenario here in North America is actually very, very bad. And $75 billion were paid out recently, right? For, for a case like this, where there was thrombose basal artery from a vertebral dissection after neck manipulation. So the radiologist who was reading this case, they picked up the neck dissection, and but they missed findings in the brain, right? They missed finding the brain. So again, teaching point here is that midline structures, right? Midline structures are very easy to be missed or overlooked, keep that in mind. Second important teaching point is, again, I call this life lesson, right? If you have one finding, don't get just totally involved in what you have seen. Ignore that finding, look for more abnormalities, right? This patient can have more than one findings and more than one abnormalities and keep looking. And uh, the satisfaction of search is something that can hurt you. So this leads us into 
the differential diagnosis of vascular conditions, right? I've shown you dense basal artery. The other vascular condition that typically involves, again, now I'm introducing a second thalamic subsite, which is paramedian thalamic involvement. Notice it is not going like this all the way, right? It is not completely paraventricular starting from top and goes down. This is like, you know, two rounded things, paramedian thalamic involvement. And this is classic for artery of Percheron infarction, paramedian thalamic involvement. The other scenario where we can have exactly the same paramedian thalamic involvement is top of basilar, right? The case that I showed you earlier. The only way to diagnose and differentiate between artery of Percheron and top of basilar is you look at your vascular study, whatever you have, CTA, MRA, whatever else. The only clue is that artery of Percheron is not seen on imaging, which means that your vascular CTA, MRA will be absolutely normal. And this is what I'm showing you here. If it is abnormal, then very easy to pick up. And this is how we distinguish between artery of Percheron and top of basilar. Now, this is paramedian thalamic involvement. If you have involvement of the entire thalamus, now this is called as pan thalamic involvement. And you think about, and you know, this may or may not involve more anteriorly, the other deep gray structures, basal ganglia, this becomes deep cerebral vein thrombosis. And another example, notice that all of these structures are very dense, right? Very dense. When we have all of this, and this is so symmetric, we, we look at this, and sometimes these things, these things, and these things are overlooked, right? Again, another example of bilateral or deep cerebral vein thrombosis. The point is that this finding can be unilateral, right? This finding can be unilateral, as I'm showing you in this case. Right, this case was actually referred to us from an outside facility, from an outside facility, and they, came back and they had this MRI next morning, and this was called a glioblastoma. This was called a glioblastoma at the outside hospital, also. Right, the requisition slip that came to us also said glioblastoma. The radiologist who was looking at this. They said findings consistent with a high-grade glioma, right? What is wrong here? There are several things that are wrong here. I had to call the neurosurgeon. I said, Dr. So-and-so, I don't think we are dealing with a glioblastoma. And I told him that, you know, I think we are dealing with what? I think we are dealing with venous infarct, right? Venous infarct. Why? Because this dot, that dot, this dot, is the clot, right? It is unilateral clot in basal vein of Rosenthal, right? And this is, and it was very hard to convince them, but again, this patient, you know, went to, to angiogram and one of our neuro IR uh, physicians, they, they extracted, you know, a ton of clot outside the, from the venous sinuses anywhere. Now this is, if you have, now these venous infarcts can present with hemorrhages in bilateral thalamide. So if you have a patient with bilateral thalamic hemorrhages, you think about venous infarct. If you have a patient with bilateral thalamic hemorrhages, you think about encephalitis, particularly Japanese encephalitis. If you have a patient with bilateral thalamic hemorrhages, in this classic distribution, which is I call a trilaminar type pattern, see trilaminar type pattern, this is acute necrotizing encephalitis, right? Acute necrotizing encephalitis. And I've shown you this example uh, during the previous uh, infection talk already. All right, so now we'll move on and we'll talk about lesions when we have involvement of more than one nucleus, right? So I've shown you carded, I've shown you, you know, other parts of lentiform nucleus, I've shown you thalamus, now I'm showing you combination, right? If you have a combination, and again, remember, this is a case that I showed you earlier in your one of your unknown cases. And I put this on my book because this, these findings are, are not just very beautiful, but there are so many teaching points. And if you make the right diagnosis, patient will wake up in 15 minutes. This patient came in like this, right? And if you tell them, you know what? This is classic hypoglycemia. How? There are two things. Number one, 
It only involves the basal ganglia, but typically spares, classically spares the, the bilateral thalamide. It spares the superficial subcortical white matter. It spares the brainstem, spares the cerebellum. The only white matter it involves is the splenium of corpus callosum in a boomerang-shaped fashion. I'm showing you this example. And notice there is profound restricted diffusion, right? So these are classic imaging findings of hypoglycemia. When you see something like this, you stop what you're doing, you pick up the phone, make a phone call, and the patient will wake up in 15 minutes after they have injected and dextrose or D50. And here is the differential diagnosis of lesions where you have involvement of bilateral basal ganglia, diffusion restriction, and you have associated involvement of the superficial gray matter, right? Keep in mind that you have to ask the right question. This list over here is all acute, right? And this example over here is not acute, right? It's not acute, and this is CJD, and we'll talk more about that subsequently. Now, now again, notice that there is involvement of, again, these two nuclei, right? Caudate and lentiform nucleus. Look at this, right? Very typical, and this is on follow-up. Now, this is again, an example of Lee's disease. Lee's disease, and the way I teach, you know, how do we diagnose Lee's disease is that anytime you have involvement of bilateral basal ganglia and brainstem. So keep in mind three things. Number one, this example over here, Lee's disease. Number two, I'll show you Wilson's disease. Number three, Wernicke's encephalopathy. And there are two other ones that can also present with bilateral basal ganglia or deep gray with brainstem. One is osmotic demyelination when you have extra pontine involvement. And lastly, encephalitis, right? Lastly, encephalitis. So this is the differential diagnosis of lesions that involve bilateral basal ganglia and bilateral basal ganglia and brainstem. Again, the classic thing, if you, you know, you all know that I, I love spectroscopy and this is the inverted doublet of lactate. So if you can show this lactate peak, you, you have made this diagnosis non-invasively of Lee's disease on, on imaging. Now, Alex, this is the case that I put in for you because I know you would love it. You know, we all talk about, we all talk about eye of tiger sign, right? Eye of tiger sign. And this is another example where I'm showing you a putaminal, a putaminal tiger, right? Notice this classic sparing of the posterior portion of the putamina, right? Everything else is abnormal. Again, caudate and lentiform nucleus. And this is a condition which is known as Megdell syndrome. Very rare, but you know, these are things that if you have seen them once, you have seen them all because they all look very similar. This is methyl glutaconic aciduria, deafness, encephalopathy, and Lays like syndrome, and Lays like syndrome, which is called Megdell syndrome, and classic appearance of putaminal tiger. Putaminal tiger. I will show it one more time so you all can, can take a look and save it in your, in your permanent memory. Okay. Megdell syndrome. Okay. Next case. Now, moving on to the next entity. Now, this is also something that you know, we, we have to keep in mind because. Again, notice that there is involvement of bilateral caudate nuclei and lentiform and all this patchy involvement of subcortical white matter with diffusion restriction. This is also a reversible entity and a reversible entity. And if you have seen one case, I think you have seen almost all cases. So again, responsive to therapy and which is why again, another highlight then, you know, we, that a role that we play in making, making the accurate diagnosis on imaging. And for those of you who are astute, you can also pick up this abnormality, which is also typically involving the paramedian portion of the, of the thalamus. Next case. Now, until now, I've shown you caudate and putamina, and I'm showing you when you have involvement of almost all of these multiple nuclei at the same time, right? And we see something like this, you have a typical story. It is not a difficult diagnosis to make, right? We are dealing with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy or hypoxic ischemic brain injury, right? Now this case, again, we have involvement of multiple nuclei, but this time the findings are very asymmetric. In addition to involvement of these deep gray structures, right? 
what do we see? There is involvement of superficial cortex and there is involvement of this, another specific thalamic subside, which is the pulvinar of the thalamus. When you have superficial gray matter involvement and you have involvement of only this region, the pulvinar, the posterior and the medial part of the thalamus, you think about seizure related changes, right? Don't call this a low grade glioma. In this case, it was actually called a low grade glioma, right? So that's a mistake. Don't call this a low grade glioma. These are just seizure related changes. This is a type of, a fourth type of brain edema. And the three classic types that we all learn about is cytotoxic, acute ischemia, vasogenic, brain metastases, interstitial, seen in obstructive hydrocephalus. This is the fourth kind, fourth kind, right, which is reversible cerebral edema, which is a combination of cytotoxic and vasogenic edema and is seen in patients with status epilepticus or also known as seizure-related changes, right? This, this case is not that difficult, right? You know, we, we see these findings in middle-aged person movement disorder. You ask for CT because you know that you will start seeing extensive dense calcifications in all of these areas, not just the gray nuclei, but also in the cerebellar white matter and also in the subcortical white matter, right? Keep in mind, FARS disease and FARS syndrome, okay? Now, the other scenario, right? The other scenario where you will find very similar imaging findings, but this time there is no movement disorder. Instead, there is a very different kind of clinical setting that is provided to you, right? And another reason why I, I recommend and, and I, I say that, you know, we all should be using social media in a way that supports our education. And I've always been saying that in this day and age, the best place for getting radiology education is social media, right? And this is the case that we posted last month. And this was actually submitted by one of our former fellows, now a faculty in Boston. And this is a case of mineralizing microangiopathy, also known as radiation induced changes. And all of these findings were described when, you know, this QR code is right over here. If anybody wants to join any of these, any of these social media pages, feel free to email me and I will add you because these are all closed groups. Okay. Now this brings us to the differential diagnosis of lesions that have hyperintensity. Again, I'm going a little bit faster. I know that there is no time to review this list. I'm giving these things to you and more description is in the manuscript, lectures are recorded. You will have to go back, re-review, read, and keep these things where in your back pocket because these things are important and they come up almost all the time. The last location that I will discuss is involvement of brainstem. Now, if you have involvement of brainstem, I've shown you involvement of deep brainstem tracts and cerebellar white matter in patients with heroin. If you have involvement of central pumps, right, easy, with sparing of the peripheral portions, like I'm showing you over here, this is a patient of, this is a case of osmotic demyelination, right? If you can have, previously we used to call this central pontine myelinolysis, which was incorrect because this obviously has extra pontine sites of involvement, right? Therefore, the preferred terminology is osmotic demyelination. And in many cases, you will see that the involvement of pons not just spares the peripheral portion, but also spares this area over here, which is where the corticospinal tracts run, right? And this is called the, the classic trident sign in radiology. And this is diagnostic for osmotic demyelination. Now, if you have sparing of red nuclei, right? Red nuclei. If you have sparing of red nuclei, you have involvement of bilateral basal ganglia and thalami and intrinsic hyperintensity on T1. This is the classic uh, phase of giant panda sign, which is described in patients with Wilson's disease, right? Or intrinsic T1 hyperintensity, sparing of red nucleus, upper part of brainstem is involved and typical appearance of face of panda, this is uh, Wilson's disease, right? So I mentioned this earlier, if you have 
lesions in the basal ganglia with brainstem involvement, you think about these things. Okay. Lastly, I've shown you cases where there was involvement of cerebellar white matter. Now, if you have typical involvement of the dentate nucleus, right, with or without involvement of white matter elsewhere, and when I say elsewhere, I mean the splenium of corpus callosum and bilateral MCPs or middle cerebellar peduncles. This is a patient with metronidazole toxicity. And here is another example of metronidazole toxicity. Now, I've shown you lentiform nucleus sign, right? Where it's fused, edematous fused internal and external capsules. Now, notice if you only have edema involving the external capsules and to a lesser extent of the internal capsules with bilateral temporal lobe involvement. Now this is classically described as the bracket sign of Eastern equine encephalitis, which I believe is not very common in, uh, in Armenia or in some other portions of the world. All right, so lastly, you know, you can have involvement of bilateral you know, the perivascular spaces are involved. You can have in patients with dementia. This is cryptococcus I showed you last time. This is asymmetric involvement and enhancement of the perivascular spaces, difficult diagnosis to make, intravascular lymphoma. And this was a case of neurosarcoid. If you have enhancement limited to the brain stem, with or without involvement of the middle cerebellar peduncle or cerebellar white matter, you think about clippers, another entity that can present with this. So here's my summary slide. And let me know if there are any questions. I will go back to the unknown cases now so that we can finish on time. There is a lot of advanced stuff that we have been doing with many of these bilateral basal ganglia lesions, but I'm gonna skip that in the interest of time. And I will show you the the final unknown cases so we can wrap up in time and we can save maybe a few minutes for some Q&A. All right, so this was your unknown case number one, right? And clearly now we all are confident in making these diagnoses. This is a case that I showed you during the last talk. This is a patient with COVID associated hypoxemia. This is a patient with carbon monoxide, cocaine, and heroin. Now, this is, notice that patient with diabetes, abnormal movements, bright signal, hyperglycemia. This patient had underlying liver dysfunction. This is hepatic encephalopathy and manganese deposition. The young male, psychiatric symptoms, I'm not showing you inferiorly, there was brainstem involvement, face of giant panda, Wilson's disease. This patient had, unfortunately, again, this is something that we all should kind of take, take back and think about this. This patient had a small non-enhancing subependymoma in the obex of the fourth ventricle. And they were giving them contrast every single time for a non-enhancing tumor. And in 56 years, he got 64 doses of contrast, right? And this is all gadolinium deposition in the brain. Finally, top of basilar, arteriopercheron, Wernicke's encephalopathy, I'm sure you noticed that. And this is a patient I was telling you the, the head of nephrology here. And unfortunately, she had CJD, CJD. All right, thank you all very much for your attention. 9.57, we have three minutes for Q&A. Alex. Thank you very much, Soyesh. Very thought-provoking and a reminder of the, some of the challenges in neuroradiology. Uh, and the, uh, I like the emphasis you put on problem solving and looking deeply into the history and, uh, and for other findings. Um, I think for all of the radiologists today, I mean, I, I think this is worth watching um, more than once uh, because there's so much material to it. But I can tell you in the course of my career, these cases are not common, but every time they come up, uh, it's inescapable that there's uh, an important diagnosis to be made. The problem is which, which of these entities uh, will you choose? So, uh, Soyesh, thank you very much for uh, the enormous amount of work that must have gone into making this talk and for presenting that to us today.
Thank you all very, very much. Alex, I love you, as you know that, as always. And we are looking forward to having some of that, more of that, you know, Vermont drink that you brought last time. And <laughs> plan for that, you know, sometime soon. Well, so actually, you can look for, I'm going to send you a, a number of cases as you were talking, you reminded me of cases I've seen in the, certainly in the last year. So I'll give you some more cases if you want to uh, put those oh, in. Yeah. in your I, would love, I would love to, absolutely. I think there's a question. Somebody is raising their hand. Yes, please. You can unmute yourself, yeah. Thank you for excellent presentation. I have a question. Are calcifications almost always hyperintense on T1 weighted and hyperintense on T2 weighted images? Could you rephrase that, please, one more time? Um, uh, are calcifications almost always hyperintense on T1 weighted and hyperintense on T2 weighted, or there are some exceptions? So this is about what? Classification of what again? No, calcification. Calcification. Yeah, calcification. Oh, my calcification. God. calcification. Yeah. So, you know, that, that, this is, you're asking a difficult question. Mm -hmm. difficult I know. <laughs> but this is an important question. And the way to think about calcification, so calcification in the brain can be of two types. One is called free calcium, and the second one is called bound calcium. If you have bound calcium, again, you have to go back and I'll send you a famous paper, which was written by one of our professors that got published in radiology several years ago. And some of these concepts still hold true. The point is that if you have dense, bound calcium, it will always be dark on T1 and T2 and obviously dense on CT and susceptible on your GRE and SWI. If you have free calcium, that free calcium will appear as bright on T1, right? And that bright signal on T1 will confuse you with hemorrhage, mm -hmm. which is why we have to keep this in mind that calcium can have different imaging appearance on MR. It can be bright on T1, and we have to think about free calcium. We have to think about this not hemorrhage, which is why we have to look at everything else, which is why MR is not an easy thing. Yeah. Thanks. Alex, you can add here, but you know, if you want to add something to this. No, I think I, I think that. Uh very clear explanation as best we understand it. And, but it is, uh, it's reminiscent of, it, be, it would be like asking the question, how does intraperitoneal hemorrhage look in the brain? It has a variety of appearances and, and that adds to the confusion that we encounter with it. Um, but this hyper, I don't know that, uh, I, I didn't look carefully on your differential switch, but there are cases of neurofibromatosis where there's T1 shortening in the basal ganglia. And that's not entirely uh, clear why that is, but it probably along the lines that you've indicated uh, some, uh, some uh, chemical uh, agent that is causing that T1 shortening. Um, you know, and I'm also reminded about, you know, coming back to this issue about uh, multiple entities, many patients with Wilson's disease have hepatic dysfunction. And so, so again, it's, it's often difficult to, uh, to be sure what is the source of the abnormality on the MR scan. But I, I like your approach of patterns and saying, regardless of the cause, uh, this is the appearance of that entity, or at least what you should be thinking about when you see these, this constellation of findings. Yeah, no, thank you. Very important. Yeah, these are great points. Great points. And, you know, this illustrates the, you know, I always say that, you know, Alex and I have done several talks and presentations and teaching sessions to for our trainees and residents and fellows. And one thing that I, I learned from him, and I still remember, is that, you know, there was one time where Alex and I, we did like almost hour and a half presentation and we did not prepare anything, right? We did not prepare anything. And, you know, I had cases and he was taking all of those cases and explaining them to the trainees. And this is what I call is a true professor that you don't have to prepare anything, right? This is years and years of experience and knowledge. And so this is phenomenal. I love it. Thank you, Swayesh. So
Well, thank you all. And again, uh, I'll be posting uh, the this uh, video will be on uh, this uh, uh, website I have for has a number of lectures on it. And I, I would encourage you to look at this again. So yes, excellent. Thank you very much for your time and dedication. Thank you all and see you later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you.